Let us open our Bibles on Genesis chapter 37. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 37, I will read the entire chapter. Guys, I think there's no way I'll, I'll, I'll end the chapter today, okay? I think there's no way. My sermon here is for the entire chapter, but I, I highly doubt I will get to it. I really, really doubt. So most likely this is only part one. So let us open our Bibles. I'll read the entire chapter, Genesis chapter 37. I'll go from verse 1. Uh, the real deal begins on verse 2. Verse 1 looks more like a matter that was covered on the previous sermon. But I'll read verse 1 again. I'll read the entire chapter, Genesis chapter 37. Let us read the entire chapter. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were biding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter, the matter in mind. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are, you not, are not your brothers in feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, Here am I. Now here I am. Then he said to him, Please go and see if it's well with your brothers. And well with the flocks, and bring word to, and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, "What are you seeking?" So he said, "I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks." And the men said, They have departed from here, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us now kill him, and cast him into some pit, and we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard of it, heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring, back to his, and bring him back to his father. 
So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh, on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed the kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. So far the reading of the word of the Lord. What a chapter, isn't it? What a chapter. Joseph is one of the story of Joseph is one of the most well known stories in the entire Bible. Even Hollywood makes movies about this. Uh, I remember a children's movie called Joseph, King of Dreams, telling about telling the story of Joseph. Uh, it's a it's a well known story. It's the lo- it's the most detailed account on anyone's life in the Old Testament, apart from Moses himself, of course. In the Torah, at least. The Torah focuses on no one else, but apart from Moses, but Joseph. And his story is quite fantastic. Jo- there, it's, it's no wonder why Christians and the non-Christians alike appreciate hearing the story of Joseph. It began when he was 17, and up and down, it, it sounds like an expression that doesn't, doesn't really cut it. I mean, going, going from slavery, going from a rich family into slavery, and then up into the second most important position in the country of Egypt. Most likely the world, because after the, the hunger, after the, the years of hunger, most likely Egypt was the only country that did not succumb to economic uh, depression. Actually, the country, be, the government became even richer. We read that Joseph bought the entire land and all the people that lived on the land. Because people sold their land, sold their cattle, sold everything, sold themselves. Egypt, the surrounding nations all came to Egypt to get, to buy food. And Egypt had food, so most likely became the most powerful nation in its time. Now, and pivotal on this entire situation, we see Joseph. It began when he was but 17 years old. But the story began very, 
from the get-go, it was quite dramatic. Now, I want to read to you two verses that are found in Leviticus. This one, I would like you to go there with me. Please open your Bibles on the book of Leviticus. You keep a finger there on Genesis 37 because we will look at many verses. But go there with me to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 and 18. Leviticus chapter 19. These two verses, they pretty much uh, describe, I don't want to say describe, they, they, they covered all the main elements on, on Genesis 37. So Leviticus 17, verses 17, ver, ver, sorry, Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So this is what God is commanding the people of Israel. Right there on the Old Testament, God is saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, isn't these verses, this, aren't these two verses exactly what we see in the entire book of Gen or in the entire chapter of Genesis 37? We begin with, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. Isn't that exactly what the brothers did? We continue, you shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Oh, isn't that what Joseph did when Joseph told his father about what his brothers were doing? Continuing, you shall not take vengeance. Isn't that exactly what the brothers did? Oh, we hate you. We've, you told, you ratted us to our father. You blew the whistle on us. We hate you from now on. And isn't that what Joseph did not do? Many years later, it's not here on the chapter 37, but I'm sure you guys know this story. When he revealed himself to his brothers, he said, fear not, I'm not angry with you, don't be afraid of me. So he forgave his brothers. Continuing, not bear, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Exactly, exactly what Joseph did in, the, in his life. The, the, the sum of Joseph's life is... is a great lesson in forgiveness and not bearing a grudge. You know when people come to you and they... No, let me start again. Do you have this? Do you have this in your life? I remember that for a while I had this. I had this guy on high school, not high school, before, middle school. I had big problems with him. We, 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 we used to fight on school. Every other month, we were fighting in school. It was on my seventh grade. I was, at the time, I was, what, 13 years old? And I developed such a hatred of him in my heart. Uh, it was, was not for, for little, because the guy was, he was the third best swimmer in the entire state. So he was this tall, he was this wide. Now his legs were, his arms were the size of my leg. So it was a very bad idea for me to fight him. So sometimes I'd fight, sometimes I'd run, sometimes I'd fight again, sometimes I'd run. Whatever I thought was more expedient. <laughs> and I remember that, thank God, he moved to another school after the end of that year. And two years later, I, I caught myself remembering what went through between him and I. And I remember, I remember remembering that, those events. And after I would remember those events, I would find myself completely sweat. I would really, I would touch my forehead and my hands would be all wet. And there I was, I was sitting down, just thinking about the past. And I got completely sweat because I was remembering what took place. Now, can that, can that be called, I have forgiven him? Can, can I say that? Or... I forgave and I put it on the past 
And I, I, I brought it to the cross and I said, Jesus, take care of this for me. Can I say that? <laughs> Not a chance. Not a chance. Years later. And then I was, I was sweating. And I, I remember waking up in the middle of the night sometimes. And I would, let's, you know when you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and then you sit down and your mind goes to a thousand different places before you actually fall asleep? And I would remember this and I would, I would, I would sweat. Some days you would be on, I will be covering and I would sweat. Don't bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now here we have Joseph being able to forgive brothers that sold him to slavery. I, I cannot imagine. Guys, I'm preaching on this chapter, but if you ask me, Philippe, can you really imagine how he felt? No. I mean, how would you? I mean, thank God, I, my, my blood brothers, I have two brothers, Good relationship. I cannot picture one of them selling me into slavery, let alone both of them. I, I really cannot. I, I, I really, really cannot. So I'm preaching about a level of forgiveness that I, it, it's so much beyond all that I can imagine. But nevertheless, we have this for us. I ask you, do you bear a grudge to people? Do you, do you remember stories of, I don't know, five months ago, five years ago, maybe 50 years ago, that hurt you profoundly until today? Do you, have you ever heard of these people that say, oh, I don't like that guy. Oh, what happened? 20 years ago, he borrowed 10 bucks with me and he never paid me back. Have you ever heard of those stories? Like decades, and the person borrowed, I don't know, like $5. And maybe the person forgot, or whatever it was. And the person still remembers that event. And that person, oh, I don't like him because of that. I mean, when, when would the person ever let go? Do I ask you this, are you one of those? Are you one of those that you just can't forget? You just can't forget. I remember my grandma. She, she's gone already. And she used to tell me about a story that was 30 years. When she told me the story 10 years ago, the story was already 30 years old. And she told me the story of um, a customer that came into the store, and the customer was rude to her. And the customer happened to be from a specific Christian denomination, the denomination that eventually I joined. And she told me once, my son... My, my grandson, I love you, you know that, but I don't like your denomination. And, she, and I asked her, why? Oh, because 20, 30 years ago, a customer from your denomination came into my store and mistreated me. 30 years. It, I think if you ask that person, the person doesn't even remember this story. But she's still wasting the energy just to remember the event. Now, on this chapter here, now, this chapter is a wonderful chapter in, in, in teaching us. It's a wonderful chapter with a wonderful message of forgiveness. But let me tell you the main point of this chapter. The main point of this chapter is not really forgiveness, even though this is big here. The main point of this chapter is not to love your neighbor, even though this is big here. The main point of this chapter is not don't play favorites with your children or your other relatives. It, this is big here, but that's not the main point even. Here's the main point of Joseph's entire life. God was not obvious in Joseph's life, but God directed Joseph's life. Have you noticed that in the story of Joseph, there is no miracles? No miracles at all. Tell you more. Did God ever, re remember, try to remember, did God ever speak directly to Joseph? No. The, the closest that Joseph came to hearing the voice of God was when he provided the interpretation of the dreams 
of the cupbearer, the baker, and Pharaoh himself. And when he interpreted his own dreams. But that, that was about it. He never heard from God himself. He never saw a miracle. We don't have a record, that, if my memory serves me well, we don't have a record of Joseph even offering a sacrifice or leading people in worship. Zero. We don't have those records. But Joseph was completely used by God. His life, I mean, if there is a person that was used by God in order to shape worldwide events, Joseph is right there on the top three on the list. Maybe the order would be Jesus, Moses, and Joseph. I mean, that, that's how big of a deal the matter is. Maybe Noah as well. That, that's how big of a deal this is. But no miracles. No, no divine intervention on an obvious manner. That's the point of this chapter. That the hidden hand of God, I repeat, the hidden hand of God was controlling everything. That's the main point of this chapter. That's why I chose Psalm 111 to sing. Because that's the providence of God. Here's the providence of God. Is God controlling all aspects of your life and everyone else's life. That's God's providence. It's how God arranges matters in the whole. How God directs history. How God, how God prepares every single fiber of your being. How God... Remember when Jesus said that even the hairs of your head are counted? That's God's providence. But how would you feel? How would you feel? You're being sold to slavery. And somebody comes and preaches this sermon to you. Believe that the Lord is in charge of your life. And there you are. Perhaps bleeding, thirsty, in the bottom of the pit... And hearing people saying, okay, 20 shekels, he's yours. Sure, sure, okay, 20 shekels. Give me the guy. Imagine you hearing these words. And thinking, is God in control? Now, I'm going to venture a guess here, okay? I'm going to venture the following guess. Your life is not that complicated. Let, let me venture another one. Your life plus mine plus everybody else's lives here, put together. I don't think we have this level of problem. And there it is. Joseph being sold to slavery. Now let me go step by step. Look at verse 2 on Genesis chapter 37. Look at verse 2. This is the history of Jacob. Now he, remember this is that word, that Hebrew word that I taught you guys. Toledot means generation, genealogy, or the, the or usually it's translation, these are the generations, or the, in this case, the history. This is, I think, the ninth Toledot. That we have ten in the entire book. This is the la second, last one. And he says, this is the history of Jacob. But does it feel like the history of Jacob to you? Because look at the next word. Look, look, listen to this. This is the history of Jacob. The next word. Joseph. <laughs> so I, I, I really don't know. I, I'm being honest here. I'm not sure why the biblical record says this is the history of Jacob. Because in my opinion, it feels like this is the history of jo Joseph. But the word this in Hebrew, the word used here, sometimes it can also mean a reference to what came before and not, what, not what's coming next. So maybe in this case, a reference to what was just mentioned. I'm guessing, I'm guessing. That, that's my best guess on this matter. And we see here, this is the history of Joseph. Joseph was 17 years old. Guys, so he was 17 years old when he was sold. By the time he became the second person in command in Egypt, he was 30 years old. And when he met his father, he was even beyond that, Okay. So I'll update you now as time goes by in the, chronolo in the chronology, but we are talking about a 17 years old boy for now, okay? And this 17 years old boy was feeding the flock with his brothers. So which brothers? 
the half brothers, the children of Zilpah, the children of Bilhah, the children of the concubines of Jacob. Now observe that we see here, on, still in verse 2, his father's wives. Now, they were not wives, they were concubines. But here it says wives. So most likely, uh, we know that Rachel already died. We know that. Most likely Leah was already dead. Le there is no record on the Bible that of when she died. We only have Jacob on his deathbed mentioning, I buried my wife Leah in the cave of Machpelah, the cave that Abraham bought and where, he, where him and Sarah were buried and where Isaac and Rebekah were buried. That's it. So we don't have a, a mention, oh, Leah died at, on such moment and she was, we don't have. So we assume that Leah was dead by then because the two concubines had risen to the station of wives. So that, that's our impression here. Now we see here that Joseph, on the end of verse 2, Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Is Joseph right or wrong here? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I think he was unwise in the way he did it. Because we don't have a record of him coming to the brothers and say, Hey, if you guys don't shape up, I will eventually tell father. I would imagine that the problem here is that the children were not taking care of the sheep well, or that they were hiding the sheep and telling the father, oh, the sheep died. And in fact, he took it for himself, so stealing. So, I don't know, Do, it sounds bad, but I mean, how many children open the wallets of their parents and get money there? I remember one time I wanted to buy some stuff and my dad was not looking, so I opened his wallet and I got money from his wallet. And then he found out. <laughs> Didn't go so well for me. But children do that with their parents. Children do that. So maybe this was what was happening here. I don't know, but we don't see Joseph coming to the brothers and saying, brothers, stop that. If you guys don't stop this, I will tell father. Apparently he came straight to the father without giving the brothers a chance to shape up. Another, pro another possible situation here. The word here, uh, bad report, the word is, in Hebrew is diba. It can also mean slander. It can mean that maybe he was not only reporting, he was exaggerating. Maybe one brother slept instead of taking, paying attention on the sheep, and he said, oh, this guy here, he sleeps day and night, he's never awake. That would be a slander, that's an exaggeration. So it could be that Joseph was also doing that. I don't know. I don't know. But let me, you may be asking yourself, Philippi, what do I do? Is it right? Does the Bible command me to, to tell on other people? Now, here's one thing, guys. It, number one, let us not approach this topic as children, okay? Reporting the bad behavior of other people to somebody else, perhaps on a company, if a co-worker of yours is doing something wrong and you're reporting this to the boss, don't be a child about it. Understand that almost always, if not always, this has serious repercussions, okay? So never approach this topic as, oh, you should always do it or you should never do it. Don't go with sweeping statements like that. This matter is quite serious. So number one, don't approach it as children. Know that consequences will follow. I don't know if Joseph was right in the way he reported it. Maybe he even gave his brothers a chance to shape up and the brothers didn't. And eventually he brought the report back to his father. I don't know if that's the case. But how should you behave? How should you deal with this? Let's say in your company, your co-workers are not, something is wrong. And this is affecting, it's going to affect the entire department. Now here's my advice to you. If it's something that could come back to you, I would say for sure. For sure report, talk to the person first and report. You are not, you're not supposed to be harvesting the sins 
of other people. You're not, you're not supposed to be doing that. Now, try first to address the person. Okay, try first to address the person. That, that, that's, that's the only thing that I feel comfortable. I could say more on an individual basis, but right now I'm on the pulpit, and I have to be careful with what I say. So what I would say is, if the, the behaviors of some people may affect your entire department, it may cause everybody to be fired, or it may cause you to go into deep waters, then yes. But once again, try your best to address the person first, to talk to the person first, and so on, okay? Now, let me continue. We, see, we come to verse 3. The father made him a tunic of many colors. Now, you may be thinking, so what? Like, some of you, look at that. Donna is wearing a shirt, a tunic, with many colors. Does that mean that she is rich? Is that such a big deal? Do, don't, you, don't we all have a whole bunch of shirts in our closet that have like 20 different colors on them. At this time, a tunic of many colors meant a lot of money. This is very, dyeing clothes at that time was not a, a cheap pr process. You remember uh, on the New Testament, uh, I think it was Lydia, the lady that dealt in purple, that's how it says. She dealt in purple. It means she sold purple colored clothing. It means she was rich because shirts or whatever, clothing with purple color at that time was extremely expensive, was something for royalty. Because that particularly, particular color, dyeing on that color was very expensive. Now, here he has a coat with multiple, multiple colors. Actually, there are some archaeological findings that display royals wearing shirts with multiple colors but the slaves or the regular people they have maybe no color or whatever natural color the material had or just one color when much if uh, if it was a dyed shirt it was already something quite expensive multiple colors so super expensive now why did jacob do that jacob gave that to his brother to his son to show this is my favorite son so that tunic was a symbol of, his, that, of the fact that Joseph was his favorite. That tunic was a symbol of, this is my favorite boy. All the others come second. This boy here comes first. No, he was not even the firstborn. He was the second to last. And he was, his father had no problem in displaying for all to see, I love this boy more than any others. When did that ever go well? When playing favorites with children, when did that ever go well? Now, I'm told that there is no such, that every father has a favorite. I, I, I hear that. I mean, my children are quite young. I cannot speak from experience for now. I tell in my home, the youngest one is always the cutest. So I like the youngest one until they... Because they're so cute. But that's about it. So I, I don't know how parents really feel about this. I don't have experience enough to say. But here's one thing that I can say without any fear. Playing favorites and being obvious about it is a sure path to disgrace, to ruin one's family. Now, here's the part that amazes me the most. Jacob should know better. His father liked his brother more. His mother liked him more than his brother. It was obvious. Abraham, the problem that they, he had with Ishmael and Isaac. So they, they came from a family where playing favorites wrecked the family and none of them learned. That, that's the part that amazes me. None of them learned. They say that... Uh, a genius is one who learns of other people's mistakes. A wise man is a man that learns from his own mistakes. And apparently we are in extreme short, we have an extreme shortage of geniuses, don't we? We, we, 
we, it looks like we, we are built to not learn with our mistakes. That's exactly what we are seeing here. A man that should know better, and yet he insisted on playing favorites. Now comes a portion here that I have a bone to pick with Joseph. Now, most sermons that I hear about Joseph, I mean, they, they, they praise Joseph to such positions that I think, my goodness, is he talking about Joseph or Jesus? Because that, that, that's high praise, you know? But I have a bone to pick with Joseph here. I understand this is a 17 years old boy. We're talking about somebody that is just, we cannot demand that high maturity from this man. But we see that this man had dreams. And by the way, God given dreams. God given dreams. You, you may be already be thinking, Felipe, uh, does God speak with us today on dream, with through dreams? Is this something on the past only? Is it something that could be used today? Now, my first answer is, guys, there is only one place where you can go for pure revelation of God. That's the Bible. It doesn't matter what you dream. Really, it doesn't. Now, observe, I'm not saying no, okay? I'm just saying that the Bible is the only way where you can be sure to learn about God. The Bible is the only source that is 100% pure when it comes to teaching who God is. There is no other. Okay, there's no other. Now, does nature speak about God? Oh, is it? It, it does. The Bible says that one day calls into wisdom the other day. One day reveals something, reveals wisdom, and the other day the same. The Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. But is nature the place where you should be going to learn about God? No. The Bible is the place that you go in order to learn about God. But the question remains, should I always and always dismiss dreams? I have a pastor, a pastor that, pastor that I know, an acquaintance of mine in Brazil. Every time somebody comes to him and say, Pastor, I had a dream. His immediate reply is, eating too much, aren't you? <laughs> before bed. That, that's his go-to reply. He said, stop eating before going to bed and you stop dreaming. He, he, he's just like that. I, I'm not. I'm not like that. Now, here's what I'm going to say. May God speak with you through dreams. No, he may. He may. Will God ever teach you theology on your dreams? No. He, here's what theology is taught. Now, may God, may, be, may God be giving you a direct instruction for a particular matter on your life only, not other people's. On your life only. He may. I don't know. That's something that you have to ask him. I'm not comfortable in saying always no, and I'm not comfortable in saying always yes. I have had some, who, who did not have dreams that made absolutely no sense whatsoever? People sometimes dream that they are half bird, half fish. I don't know. So dreams sometimes may be absolutely nothing. But can it be that sometimes God is trying to, to wake you up to a specific matter? He may. Now, we see here that God gave him two dreams. Now, here's an interesting fact. In the ancient world, we even have records that in Babylon, guys, this is thousands and thousands of years ago, if somebody would have two dreams or dream the same thing twice, that would be a confirmation that that was given by God. Until today, I would imagine that if people dream twice on the same topic, on the same issue, or dream the same dream twice, people would be more inclined to take it more seriously. And interestingly enough, all the dreams from now on until the end of the book, they are all, they are all come in pairs. Joseph had two dreams. Pharaoh, he had two dreams. 
when he interprets the dreams of people in prison. Two guys had very similar dreams at the same night. So it all comes, always comes in pairs. But on this case here, we are dealing with a dream that we know for sure today. We know for sure that was God given. And so did they. They knew, they accepted the dream at that time. Now here's the stupidity of youth, in my opinion. He knows that his brothers hated him. He knows that his father played favorite. And here he has two dreams in which it's made obvious that he is the boss and everybody has to obey him. Now, why would he ever tell these dreams to his brothers? I don't know. And look at the way he's saying. Verse 6. Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. Now, if you know that somebody hates you to their bones, are you going to tell them a dream? Oh, I dreamed about you. I dreamed that I became your boss. Isn't that throwing fuel on the fire? I would imagine that if that, if you want to be wise on a situation like this, you keep the dream to yourself or you go to your dad and say, Dad, I dreamed this. You know, I know you love me. I want to share this with you. I trust you. I want to let you know that this happened. But apparently, and then they hated him, and then he dreamed again, and he told the other dream also. So I see here a lot of the stupidity of youth. And I see the stupidity of youth even further. When his father tells him, son, your brothers are in Shechem, they're pasturing the, the cattle, go there. Go and bring me a report. Now, I do not know to which extent Jacob was aware of the hatred of his children towards Joseph. Because he just sent his son like sheep to the midst of wolves. And they were not even just 30 minutes walking distance. Guys, they were, in my, just to give an idea, from Shechem, he had to go to Dothan. That's a 17 kilometer walk. That's what, 10 miles, a bit more than 10 miles walk. And from his house to Shechem was a whole number of miles already. So he was far away. These were multiple days journey. Remember, they didn't have nice paved roads like we have now. This is going up and down through mountains, okay? Sometimes, maybe, maybe through woods. So this took a few days to get there. And his father sent his son as sheep to the midst of wolves and Here's the part that I find it, that I'm amazed at how naive Joseph was. He went there with the tunic. I'm going to meet my brothers who hate me in the midst of nowhere, and I'm going to bring the symbol of their hatred right here on my body. Once again, the stupidity of youth. But I don't have a bone to pick with Joseph on this, but I do have a bone to pick with Jacob himself. Jacob failed to be aware of what was going on under his own roof. Guys, this is not the same time that Jacob does that, isn't it? We see Jacob, when he was addressing his wives and concubines, that he did the same. He, was, he seemed to be unaware of the massive fight among, amongst themselves, the, his own house. His wives and concubines did not get along at all. And, or he didn't care, or he was not even aware. Here, the same story. Or he didn't care, or he was not even aware. Are you and I like that? Do we close our eyes to things that are happening inside our own home? I find it fascinating. Now, particularly with married couples. I find it fascinating that they seem to believe that time will heal their problems. Oh, just, yeah, don't, don't talk about it. Just, just let it go. It will be okay. See, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm 35 years old. I've been married for 10 years. I know enough that that's a lie. But I, I, I observe couples that are married for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. 
And somehow they have this weird notion that ah, if you don't talk about it, it will be OK. Where, where did that come from? And apparently, Jacob had the same philosophy. Our time will heal our wounds. No, it won't. No, it won't. In fact, on this case, time made it worse. In some cases, time does bring forgiveness. We see the case of Esau. He forgave his brother. Initially, he said, I'm going to split his neck. Later on, he ran, hugged him, kissed him, and wept. And wept because he was so happy. Now, that's for people that were away from each other for two decades. For people that live together, not talking about an issue, it may actually become a cancer and that, that grows and eventually the couple is, they're so far apart from each other and they ask, they don't even remember where things went wrong. Well, continuing, continuing here, we see that, we see the, the invisible hand of God yet again. This will be the last point I want to make. I've been preaching for a while already, and I'll be going to the conclusion. But this is the last point I want to make now. Sometimes the Bible has some verses that we may be thinking, that make us wonder, why, why is this here? You take, for example, verse 15. Look there. On verse 14, he went to Hebron and went to Shechem. Guys, remember Shechem is the name of the prince of the city the guy that actually raped his, his sister, Dina, and they went there and they destroyed all the men of that city. They killed all the men, they took the women and the children, enslaved them, or maybe sold them, or whatever. So the city was empty. So they were shepherding the sheep on that city. So they still were, had interest on that location. Apparently the ground was excellent. So they were there. Shepherding, they were supposed to be there shepherding in Shechem. Eventually they went to Dothan and he was sent there. On verse 15 we see now a certain man. I mean, who in the world is this? And the Bible just said no, he was just, just a man. We, we don't know who he was. We know nothing about the man. Just that he was a man. Found Joseph. And there he was wandering in the field. So Joseph was lost. If God would not have sent this man here, what would have happened? Joseph, Joseph would have come back home. He would not have been sold. No problem. Who sent this man there? Now, does the Bible say God sent that man to say, no, Joseph, your brothers are not here. Your brothers are in Dothan. The Bible doesn't say this. Was it an angel? No. It was just a regular, a regular dude there. Just a regular Joe. Just a regular man. And he met him there and said, no, you, your, your brothers are somewhere else. See, an, another situation here. Verse 25. And they sat down to eat a meal. The brother was crying on the pit. And they sat down to eat. They didn't care at all. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. Why is the Bible telling us that? Why, why don't the Bible just say that Joseph left his house and eventually found his brothers? Why did the Bible say a certain man found him? Why spend time saying this? And here... The Bible said, oh, there was a, a company of Ishmaelites. And they were going from this place to that place. And they were carrying this and this. And th Why bother with this? Why the details? Oh, they were selling balm. Did that change your life right now? Oh, the, the company of Ishmaelites, they had spices. Is that revolutionary for you? Now, why, why, why is this here? with a very clear reason. This is simply to say, these two specific examples are here simply to say God was acting through ordinary means in order to bring his plan to completion. That's it. 
Who is God using? Just a dude. Who is God using? Just a company of Ishmaelites that were bearing spices, balm, and more. Regular tradesmen. Regular people. That's it. So Moses wrote this chapter masterfully. And in order so that we may read today, and the people of his time mostly, to read them and see God is not obvious, but God is perfectly there. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is perfectly there in your life? Do you believe that? When you have a flat tire, do you believe that God is there? When your rice burns, when your cake on your oven did not work well, when you crash your car, when the doctor tells you, look, you have a serious disease, when somebody from a family brings horrible news, when the phone rings and you feel a chill in your spine because you, you think that bad news are coming, do you believe that God is there on those moments? God is using whatever happens in your life to shape you. Remember that. Remember that. God sent Joseph to slavery only to teach him I am with you trust me I have a plan now this may, you may be thinking Philippe God could have done this in a more direct manner couldn't he no really you guys remember the apostle Paul God God God, huh? God told him Paul fear not I want you to bear witness of me in Rome. So God said, Paul, I will take you to Rome. Paul, it is my desire, Paul, that you reach Rome so that you may preach in Rome. And Paul had a shipwreck. Think about that. Joseph. It was God's plan that this man would be used to save millions and millions and millions and millions of lives. And he went through slavery. I mean, you explain that to me. Explain me that. From slavery to second highest position in the world, most likely, it took him 13, 13 years. Those 13 years, he had some time serving on the house of the carpenter of the guard. That didn't sound too bad. And later on in prison. That, that sounds bad. Guys, prison at that time is not prison like today, okay? That you have, uh, you can sunbathe, you have your meal prepared for you, and everything is given to you. You have a nice, well, maybe not nice, but you have a bed on prison and so on. Prison at that time was not this, okay? Prison at that time was, hopefully you're not going to die there of cold or heat or whatever it is, or diseases, whatever it is. At that time, if you caught a disease in prison, they'll simply lock the door and bear and bar the door even more, like put planks there and you suffocate there or breathe hardly there and, and you die there, that's it. Or maybe somebody is already like this and you go to prison, they throw you in there with that guy. That was prison at that time. And Joseph had to endure that. Joseph had to endure that. Why? God's providence. Now Joseph had 13 years. Now picture you and I. Pi Forgive me, let me start again. You and I. Picture this. Joseph, 13 years, asking the following question. God, why? Picture that. 13 years. Why, 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 why? Guys, I don't even know if Joseph was raped during this time. Let me tell you this. When somebody becomes a slave, that somebody is a non-person. He's just a thing. I, I, can, I can only imagine the kind of things that this man went through. And he was still faithful to the Lord. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. He said no. He kept his faith, he kept his morals, he kept his 
what he learned about God from his father? For 13 years. Did God ever tell him during those 13 years why he did that? No. So he endured 13 years of silence. I wonder if Joseph was thinking, God, you are a liar. You gave me a dream, two dreams, saying that I would rule over my family. I don't even have a family anymore. Imagine that. 13 years, Joseph was like this. Whose fault was it? I wanna, this is my first point of the conclusion and I'll do only this one. Whose fault was it? Whose fault was it that Joseph was there enduring prison, slavery for 13 years? Whose fault is it? And the answer is not his, not his fault. If you wanna blame somebody, maybe you could blame the brothers. But would that really help Joseph? No. If you ever hear, hey, you are suffering because other somebody else did something wrong, would that really help you? No. After more than 13, more than 13 years, Joseph made the following comment on the book, on chapter 45. God, when he finally met his brothers, he said, God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth. Did you hear this right? Joseph said, God sent me. Now, wait a minute. We just have the biblical record saying his brother sold him to slavery. Now Joseph, the guy who was sold, he said, no, 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 no. God sent me. Now, which one is it? He was sold into slavery or God sent him? Which one is it? A or B? Now, the answer is both. They're both true. They're both true. Now, you may be thinking, Felipe, what about me? Brothers and sisters, whatever befalls you, remember this, God is there. God is there. But Felipe, you don't know my story. That's true. You can tell me, and we can change that, by the way. But let's say you don't tell me. I can still preach the same sermon to you. You're not in slavery right now, are you? God is there. What about Jesus? What about Jesus? What about Jesus? There he was at the Garden of Gethsemane. His most crucial hour. And his disciples were napping. And then he wake them up and say, Guys, I'm not feeling well. This is a crucial moment for me. Please. I mean, can't you guys stay up for an hour? Really? Uh, you guys see... I mean, they could see already that he was sweating blood. Okay. I, I, read a, I read a biological report once saying that when the body goes into a profound, profound state of depression, even the pores of the skin, they can burst, they can shred, they can tear apart. So it would look like the person is sweating blood. Jesus was like that. What, his sweating blood was not a miracle was a biological sign of how profoundly depressed and sad he was at that moment. And at that moment, the moment that he most needed, he, people slept. And when they woke up, they abandoned him. Think about that. If they are with me, they're sleeping. If they're awake, they leave. That is the savior of the world. This is God on the flesh. I wonder Jesus thinking, God, does it have to be this bad? God, I know, and he prayed, I know that for this reason I came. He prayed that. So he knew, Jesus did not have to ask why. He knew. But the situation got so bad that at the cross he said, 
God, why have you forsaken me? Now, here am I, a 30 years old gentleman today. I know the answer to that question. I know why God did to Jesus what he did. You, you know, God was punishing the sin of the entire church on him so that the church may be forgiven. We know the answer to that question. But Jesus was so desperate at that moment that he even asked a question that he knew the answer. Of course he knew the answer. Jesus is the king of theology. I mean, he is theology. He knew. And he was so desperate. He didn't see. Did, did Jesus see God in the cross? No. He said, I'm, I'm abandoned. Even God abandoned me. Joseph felt completely abandoned. You may feel completely abandoned. But is God there? And I close this sermon with the following answer. Yes, he is there. Let us pray. Blessed be your name, almighty God. For you are there when we see you. And you are there when we don't see you. You're God from afar, and you are God from near. O oh Lord, however may be our perception, Lord, the moments we feel that you are so close that we even have goosebumps, or the moments we feel that you never even heard our name, Oh Lord, that's the nature of feelings. They come and they go. Sometimes they're very helpful. Sometimes they are very, they're totally useless. And sometimes they are completely harmful. Oh Lord, may we not be guided by feelings. I feel A, I feel B. Oh Lord, may, not, may that not be our driving motivation. May, not, may, that, may that never be the judge on our reason, on our faith, on, even, Lord, even on decisions for daily matters. Lord, whether we see you, whether we don't see you, let us trust in you. Oh Lord, remember what you said to, to doubting Thomas. You said that to him. You, you believe because you see. Blessed are those who have not seen and believe. Oh Lord, may this church be blessed. Blessed be this church. Blessed be all those, O oh Lord who don't see and still believe. May we believe you, O Lord, regardless of our seeing or not seeing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.